that local housing needs is is here to stay. Um, the number is still 300,000 um, and the 2014 based household projections are still providing us with stability and certainty um, in advance of anything from the census. Um, there is a logic to that, obviously, but they are certainly getting dated. Um, in isolation, then, that, as, as we said, that leaves us in, in the same sort of context as the government seeking commitment to a 300,000 homes per annum delivery figure. Um, and as part of that, they're, they're looking to say, well, we're going to tightly define the circumstances for um, or exceptional circumstances to indicate that your need is less than the result of that figure. But I think you've got to put that in the wider context of the consultation um, where the document will also, the NPPF will specifically specify that LHN becomes an advisory starting point. Um, and really this context, it, it, it's it's one of several strands of the proposed changes where fundamentally we're looking at a more permissive approach um, and specifically states in the consultation document um, to give a route to plans that don't look to meet needs in full. So onto the next slide, Andy, um, just dealing with this, this specific um, element of uh, exceptional circumstances to propose a figure below local housing need. We do think that needs to be the, the focus of quite strong attention um, in people's consultation responses, particularly the reference to geographic factors where I think tight definition um, is going to be essential to any sort of supporting amendments that are made to the PPG. There's certainly a risk going back almost into the mist of time now um, of accusations of policy on testing um, and people looking to test the realism of local housing need and particularly its uplift um, or uplifts. Um, through reference to things like green belts and land use constraints. Um, that That isn't, I think, necessarily the government's intention of the consultation. Um, where it's referred to geographic factors in the um, consultation report, it's referred to, for example, um, islands with an elderly population. But there's obviously the possibility for local authorities to look to um, exploit that point and possibly suggest, well, well, will those exceptional circumstances where there's a geographic effect be limited only to, um, if you like, those physical geography aspects of an island rather than its land use constraints, such as Greenbelt. Um, we do think, and this, this goes back to some of the work that we often do in, in our team, there is a positive note in the consultation, and that's the amendments to paragraph 67. Um, in terms of where authorities might look to make provision for figures in excess of the standard method. Um, and that specifically is referenced um, economic, um, effectively economic investment ambitions. Um, so um, for those who deal with housing numbers regularly, sort of the balance between labor supply and labor demand, um, and also support for infrastructure investment. Um, one of the issues with that is it, it is a fairly sort of selective transplant of um, planning policy guidance, um, paragraph 10, shown on the slide, into the MPPF. There's no specific reference to uh, instances where there'll be upwards pressure, upwards demographic pressure on housing need um, as a result of, say, recent delivery. And that that's one of the um, aspects that's already specified in the PPG. And just looking quite carefully at the terminology of paragraph 67, it says making housing provision in excess of local housing need, whereas the PPG at the moment actually says that there will be circumstances sort of full stop where your assessment of housing need, including some of those demographic pressures, uh, will be will be upwards, will be higher than the result of the standard method. And I think we have to sort of think about that quite carefully. Um, and indeed, it's what paragraph 61 already says in the framework when we start moving on to the government's second flexibility, which is taking account of past over delivery. So on to the next slide, please, Andy. Um, I've set out some of the key points on the slide. Um, what the government is suggesting is that early level, early high levels of delivery, higher in um, the, the, the periods of adopted plans, can act as a disincentive to future rounds of plan making. And I think it came up on, have we got planning news for you, that that this is seen as um, somehow smoothing those circumstances and still incentivizing authorities to, to sort of continue planning in the future for a level 
of housing need, but the implication is that it becomes a figure below local housing need. And I think that raises a number of important questions. The first is that the government plans to measure this using differently to its adjustments to housing land supply. Um, they suggest that they'll measure this using the number of permissions granted. Um, obviously, there's a question there in terms of how those permissions are defined um, and the extent to which they would normally just meet the um, the residual for local housing need in the standard way, i.e. I for the rest of your plan period or your new plan period. Um, but if you go on to the next slide, Andy, we've we've set out some of the um, yeah, what we see as probably areas to focus on in people's consultation responses. Um, there's a reference, as I say, to defining those permissions to clear evidence. Now, does one would think that should mean that authorities have granted planning permissions that are deliverable um, if they're going to claim that their their provision, their supply has over delivered against their adopted plan targets. Um, but separately to that, there's lots of reasons why delivery might be higher at the start of plan periods um, than it is in truth over the provision those plans have made over the longer term. You know, when you get instances like large strategic sites stalling and, and the evidence of delivery being less certain longer into the plan period. Um, you know, th there's examples as well where inspectors have actually accepted downward revisions to objectively assess need in the past. And, and that leads to circumstances where delivery looks higher um, than it might otherwise have, have been had the plan pursued a higher requirement. Um, we just set out a few examples of, of how this might operate in practice as well on the next slide. Um, there's a question, um, you know, starting an authority I'm quite familiar at the bottom, West Northamptonshire. You have the circumstance of authorities that in the past have adopted requirements that are in excess of local housing need, um, and those requirements remain in excess of local housing need. Um, you know, notwithstanding any queries over housing delivery in those authorities, um, is there not in some way a sort of perverse disincentive um, to plans that have in fact made higher provision in the past because it's ha harder for them to account for past over delivery? Um, you know, the flip side of that are the top two rows of the table, for example, Bedford and Central Bedfordshire, um, where their adopted plans have... Um, sort of by express statement of those examinations sought to actively pursue housing requirements lower than local housing need and question some of the demographic assumptions that went into the 2014 based projections that the, the government still seeks to rely on. Um, and if you've seen any of our briefing notes on the census, you'll also have seen that those authorities, um, the evidence is that that population pressure is real. Those household pressures are real um, the impacts on affordability and home ownership in those authorities are real. So uh, the suggestion that over delivery in those circumstances would be measured against the left hand column and their existing housing requirements, um, I say certainly does raise some relevant questions, I think, for, for responses to the consultation that we're considering. Um, and just on to the next slide, just as a, as a brief indication here. Um, if we look sort of sub-regionally across the board, there's still a trend of worsening affordability um, in the group of authorities that we've looked at. Uh, that there's probably some suggestion that those authorities like North Hearts and Welling that are continuing to pursue plans, well, not to be fair to North Hearts recently adopted, but for numerous years, continue to pursue plans under the old um, 2012 regime for objectively assessed housing need have indeed seen sort of worsening affordability. But across the board, we're not in, in sort of circumstances for our subregion where you'd say housing need has been met in full and we've we've addressed um, worsening across affordability across the patch. Um, just briefly on to the next two flexibilities, um, we'll look at the um, housing supply and delivery test. Uh, I think these points are sort of fairly well rehearsed in summaries that you've seen of the consultation already, so I won't dwell on all the points. Um, one thing that probably is relevant to note is that although the government's proposing that the test goes for um, plans that have been adopted and remain up to date within the last five years, obviously that will apply to plans less than five years old now, as well as those that are adopted in the future. 
but the transitional arrangements in paragraph 225 are quite significant um, where they'd introduce a four-year test for authorities that are in the process of preparing their plans now, preparing they've got to regulation 18 or 19 stage with, with uh, plans that contain site allocations. Again, I suspect there'll be a number of authorities who, who look to use that flexibility um, within the context of some fairly lengthy plan making timetables that the transitional arrangements allow for up to December 2026. Um, and also there's been quite a lot said about the proposed deduction of buffers um, in the demonstration of deliverable supply um, and the proposed removal of the consequence of the housing delivery test to impose a 20% buffer. Um, what's also proposed is a change to the delivery test where where sufficient deliverable permissions have been granted, um, the consequences that do remain, i.e. the application of the presumption below 75% wouldn't be applied. It's interesting that government sees there being 115% sort of threshold for permissions there. So on the one hand, removing the buffers, but on the other hand, recognising that 100% um, of your number of homes required is being granted permission is very unlikely to lead to delivery of 100% of that level. Um, so just for my final couple of slides, um, and there's a lead into presentations by my colleagues, um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of the sort of strategic plan making implications um, of the proposed changes. And, uh, and I suppose this will this will go into effect how local authorities address their, their more flexible housing need figure, um, or their flexibility in meeting housing need. Um, I think pending um, blurb becoming an act, there is clearly going to be significance in the duty to cooperate being revoked. Um, the proposed alignment policy, um, I, I think, requires strict definition. Um, you can see it working in those cases where it would put the onus on infrastructure providers to to lead those references to paragraph 67, i.e. we need such and such investment here. Um, you know, the link roads north of Luton probably being quite a good example of those. Um, but ultimately, removing the duty makes a lot of the um, implementation of things like the urban uplift entirely voluntary. So um, my colleague Hannah will go on to talk about Greenbelt. Um, but certainly we see the retention of the urban uplift as a means of sticking with the 300,000 figure being likely to be much less effective in practice uh, due to the removal of the duty to cooperate and the the, the absence, if you like, of any sub-regional strategic planning mechanism. Um, and finally, um, I will touch briefly on the proposed uh, revisions to the test of soundness. Um, Again, I think for those who listened to uh, We Got Planning News for You last week, might have found some comfort in in the um, suggestion that there will still be, for example, rigorous testing of those authorities who look to say, yep, yeah, we do have exceptional circumstances for this alternative to local housing need. Um, but again, within the wider context of the consultation, um, I think a world where it's been termed the test of plans will be, are they effective, are they deliverable, and do they meet as much housing need as possible? Um, it's interesting to see what extent the government will make consequential changes um, to, to the MPPF that would make things even more, um, if you like, permissive. So it, it's interesting for your notes. Um, at paragraph 26, pending the removal of the duty to cooperate, and paragraph 142, you've still got references to, um, in those cases, respectively, engagement with neighbours and um, any review of Greenbelt boundaries being justified. Um, so there is, I think, still a position through national policy that where plans are, where plans are being prepared or where specific elements of plans are being prepared, the evidence should still be challengeable, but what what remains unclear is really how PINs will put that into practice with the deletion of one of the whole the whole tests of soundness, i.e., the justified test. And really, that is the test that we've historically relied upon to get rigor into the examination process. Um, and, and final final point from me: again, the test of deliverability would be 
I think, essential in, in circumstances where you're removing the housing land supply tests. We've, we've seen so few plans under the 2019 framework and the new definition to date. Um, the ability of examinations to deliver that um, rigorous and robust assessment of deliverability is always is already, I think, dubious. Um, and there needs to be measures to to to, if you like, beef that up, really. Um, what we would say to beef that up as part of um, sort of leaving some rigor in the process following the proposed changes. Um, and on that note, I'll leave, hand over to my colleague, Hannah. Thanks, John. So as Andy highlighted at the start, I'll be looking at key changes to the Green Belt, older persons housing need, and also touching on developer accountability. So in respect to the Green Belt, the key change is that the prospectus makes it very clear that local, local planning authorities will not be required to review and alter Green Belt boundaries if this would be the only way in which they could meet their objectively assessed needs in full. This is outlined in draft paragraph 142, which is currently on screen. That said, where a local planning authority does wish to review their green belt boundary, they're not prevented from doing so, but we, we think this will essentially become a political decision. We also feel that these provisions will likely restrict many areas in meeting their housing needs, as John has already touched on. In this sense, paragraph 142 appears to offer a contradictory approach requiring consideration to be given to both the ability of green belt boundaries to endure beyond a plan period and also to promote sustainable patterns of development. Interestingly, where lo local planning authorities do not consider it appropriate to undertake a wider assessment of their greenbelt boundaries, they can undertake a review to consider meeting specific housing needs, for example, older persons housing. And in such circumstances, it does appear to be a matter of local choice. They're the key changes um, for, to, the, to the actual prospectus, um, but we are already seeing ramifications of the consultation, particularly in the stalling of local plans and reviews where Greenbelt is a constraint. So if you just move to the next slide, Andy. So that on the screen, there's a couple, couple of examples here where we are seeing delays and just taking each of these in turn. So Mole Valley District Council recently paused its local plan saying that it would be unwise to carry on and have since written to the inspector for a main modification to delete all the Greenbelt sites in the local plan in order to make the plan consistent with imminent national policy. South Staffordshire District Council have also said they're seeking clarity on the new national proposals and until they fully understand the potential implications will not be submitting the local plan to the inspector for examination. Around 80% of South Staffordshire District is within the green belt so this is potentially a huge implication for that particular area and similarly in North Somerset they've also announced the council has made a decision to await clarity on the critical issues including the revised method of calculating housing requirement which John's discussed earlier and in increased protection for constrained areas, including Greenbelt, before finalising a revised version of their local plan. We also anticipate that we'll see others follow suit, and I know we're sort of summarising that a little bit later on. Next slide, please, Andy. So touching on older persons housing need, I think one positive emerging from the review is the government's exploration of how the framework may enhance the provision of housing for older people, particularly draft paragraph 63, adds an additional specific expectation that with ensuring that the needs of older people are met, particular regard is given to retirement housing, housing with care and care homes, which are all really important typologies of housing that can help support an ageing population. Beyond that, there's not much else in the actual prospectus changing. Um, the government are also launching a task force on older persons housing, which will explore how the choice and access to housing options for older people can be improved, although there's currently no clear time frame for this. And I think our question is, is it enough? Um, there is already a requirement for local authorities to provide a diverse range of housing needs, including for older people. And while specifically identifying different typologies is a move towards reflecting the weight given to meeting this need in the planning practice guidance, we do feel that the proposed changes could have gone further to consider more specific questions and also consider placing requirements on local planning authorities to potentially allocate specific sites. DLP have already produced nationally based research on how to assess future older persons housing needs at a local level and this research does show how poorly we do compare internationally on housing with care and extra care options for older people so we do feel that more needs to be done and, and particularly in light of the Mayhew review. Next slide please Andy. 
so just touching on developer accountability, this is separate to the MPPF changes, but the government is also seeking changes to national policy to increase responsibilities on developers for the delivery of housing to address adverse perceptions of previous irresponsible behaviour in the decision making. And some examples of this given a non-compliance or unimplemented permissions. The consultation itself provides little demonstrable evidence of widespread unreasonable behaviour and I would be particularly interested to hear from some of our house building clients on the webinar today on their thoughts on this. In particular, the government wants to know if previous as yet defined negligent planning behaviour should be taken into consideration when granting planning permission and claim that by doing so, bad developers would no longer be able to ma manipulate the planning system, strengthening local people's confidence in it. Next slide, please, Andy. To try and tackle the reckless behaviour, um, at least two options are being considered, and these are just outlined on screen. But the first one of those is making such behaviour a material consideration in determining planning applications. And the second option is allowing local planning authorities to decline to determine applications submitted by applicants who have demonstrated a track record of past irresponsible behaviour prior to the application being considered on its planning merits. What isn't currently clear from, from the consultation is the length of time that they will be considering for past irresponsible behaviour or what they actually define as irresponsible behaviour. Um, to ensure any suggestions are fair, proportionate and feasible, um, further consultation is expected with stakeholders. But again, it, it's not clear what form of this consultation will take and when that will be. What is clear, however, is that the following three actions will be implemented in relation to build out rates specifically via potential further mods to the planning policy following the pass passing of the LERB itself. So those three actions on screen are data on developers not fulfilling their promises will be published. Developers will be required to publish data on rates of build and sale and I'd be interested just to know how easily accessible that information is from some of our developer clients and developments that would have an unacceptably slow delivery rate might be rejected. According to the government, these measures will increase transparency and public accountability when reviewing build out rates and give local government more power to take build out factors into account in planning decisions and also equip authorities with more powerful tools to address build out issues as they arise. But as I've referred to earlier, how these will be measured is not currently explained. The government have also indicated that they're proposing to start a second consultation on ideas for imposing a fee on developers who are delivering too slowly, which could have quite some substantial ramifications. I'm now going to pass on to my colleague Louise, who's going to pick up building beautiful density and local character. Thank you very much, Hannah. So building beautiful, it actually stems from the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. So the BBBBC was an independent body that advised on how to promote and increase high quality design. You may recall that the final report was published in January 2020, and that was called Living with Beauty. The three overall aims of the report were ask for beauty, refuse ugliness and promote stewardship. Now, the government's response was then published a year later in January 2021 and led to the MPPF 2021 revisions. There were quite minimal revisions actually within these consultation changes to the MPPF, a couple of insertions here and there. So chapter eight in paragraph 94 adds on and beautiful buildings. Chapter 12 in its title again adds and beautiful places to the existing title. And there's also a greater emphasis throughout the document on the use of design codes in line with the national model design code. Next slide, please, Andy. What does it mean? What will change? Now, the 2021 MPPF made it clear that all local planning authorities should prepare design guides or codes which reflect local character and design preferences. There's additional emphasis now on beauty. How will this translate into applications and developments? It's spoken and within the consultation document talked about that this could result in an increase in landscape design 
aesthetic design elements and use of natural materials. Therefore, this should result in more attractive and vibrant environments and more economic and social opportunities for all. Now, there are different scales and levels of codes, design codes and guides, and it is acknowledged that this could set across a whole development site, e.g. the Hampton Development of Peterborough or Wixom's, or across a district or council area, and this may be more high level and strategic in its basis. Now, an interesting additional consideration is the bottom bullet point there, which is under permitted development rights where prior approvals apply, this will be amended um, to include and take into account design codes that are in place for the area. There has been local level debates recently regarding, for example, the prior approval for upward extensions with the additional stories on dwelling houses. And there has also been some recent appeals in that area. So this additional consideration on the design codes will be quite crucial there. Next slide, please. So leading on from that design code emphasis, um, the government consultation does state, and this does link quite um, poignantly to John's slides on housing need, that one of the exceptions for councils to meet their housing need is where development would be significantly out of character with the existing area. This is a nod to the conservative rebel group led by Theresa Villiers, who argued to allow and it is argued that this will allow um, work with communities and will allow that the planning policy and proposals and housing targets speak to the character of areas. Now, the cons consultation is actually asking for views on what would constitute significantly out of character. That's an interesting point and one which I'm sure will be debated further. This does, though, somewhat fly in the face of multiple references in the existing MPPF, which emphasises as much use as possible of PDL and brownfield land, and does seem to discourage appropriate innovation or change, such as increased densities, which is explicitly stated in the existing MPPF, paragraph 130. Next slide, please, Andy. Now, the National Development Management Policies um, is set out within the, the LERB and within the consultation. The intention is for a concise set of separate national DM policies. Now, this will sit alongside the existing MPPF. These policies will take out those that apply sort of nationally across the country, such as Greenbelt Matters, Heritage and High Flood Risk. The current MPPF and the policies within it are only material considerations at the moment, so they do not have statutory status in decision making. But within the LERB amendments, the national DM policies will actually be able to trump the local policies where they are inconsistent. So potentially we might not have tilted balance arguments going forward. Now, the starting point for the national DM policies are the parts of the MPPF which apply to policy making. All of the local policies for shaping development and allocations will still remain in place, and that will be for local plans to determine and set out. And there will be a full public consultation to take place on the national policies following the passage of the LERB. Next slide, please, Andy. Thank you. Now, the government's case for national DM policies are that there will be sw swifter and slimmer local plans should speed up that process, make that easier and more focused for the local plan level. Local plans will be more locally relevant and easy to digest for the communities that they apply to. It will be easier for applicants to align their proposals with national and local requirements and provide greater assurance that important policy safeguards will be upheld, statutory weight and applied quickly across the country. The national policies can guide decisions, even if the local plan is out of date. Thank you. I now pass to my colleague, Rhys Bradshaw. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Louise. Right, so it's pretty clear that I've drawn the, and is there anything else slide? So uh, 
I just wanted to co cover the other main changes that uh, that are worth noting. Um, so, and the main one for me was the, the section on climate change in chapter 14, which proposes new wording at paragraph 160, adding a, an additional point C to advise that local authorities should approve applications for repowering and life extensions of existing renewable sites where the impacts can be made acceptable. These impacts should be considered from the baseline as it existed on site originally. This is a positive step and cuts through the debate about where life ext extensions fit in in the repowering regime. The presumption is now clearly to approve and demonstrates that government demonstrates that government support for repowering of schemes at a time when en energy security is a big issue. Local authorities need to take note and work positively with developers on this. We then have changes to the footnotes associated with this paragraph. The new footnote 62 lends some support for new onshore wind turbines if the planning impacts identified by communities can be addressed sufficiently and where the community supports the proposal. In these cases, turbines can be granted through local development orders, neighbourhood development orders and community right to build orders. The amendment to footnote 63 adds that suitable areas for turbines can be identified in SPDs now, as well as the development plan. The identified impacts have to be satisfactor satisfactorily addressed rather than fully, which is notable. But again, the scheme requires community support. Now, there's two obvious issues arising from both of these amendments. One is how do you define the local community? That you're seeking support from and how do you measure that support it has been suggested in the prospectus that there'd be more guidance on this but we haven't seen any to date but we we can update clients accordingly and finally we have a new paragraph 161 which places significant weight on the need to support energy efficiency improvements through the adaptation of existing buildings to improve their energy performance so all positive all positive stuff but with some significant question marks and a surprisingly light touch approach for such a prominent topic in our view. Next slide, please, Andy. Under chapter 15, conserving and enhancing natural environment, we have an amendment to footnote 67 as a direct result of Greg Smith MP's intervention to highlight the availability of agricultural land use for food production should be considered along with other policies in the framework when deciding the most appropriate sites for development. Now, there's no change to the definition of best and most versatile agricultural land, so the issue of food production really needs clarity, probably in the practice guidance. And finally, just the last amendment I wanted to pick up on and, and the one that everybody's been talking about, and that's the explicit reference to mansard roofs in uh, paragraph 122. Um, in under chapter 11, making effective use of land. The consultation scope boldly states that there is generally a negative approach taken by LPAs to upward extensions. And this has been wrong in inverted commas and that they should take a positive approach to mansard roofs alongside the usual caveats of the proposals being well designed. Well designed. This specific reference to mansard roofs says recognizes their value in securing gentle densification. That was covered by Louise earlier on. The other thing I just wanted to quickly cover in the time that I've got is the transitional arrangements. I won't go through paragraphs 225 and 226. Um, they're quite complex and they've got lots of different dates apl applying to different um, parts of the amendments. So I look to the consultation document instead. And this says that the reform plan making system will be introduced in late 24. And then to encourage plans to come forward in the short term, the consultation proposes that plan makers, local authorities and neighborhood plan groups will have until the end of June 25 to submit their plans for examination under the existing legal framework. And this will mean that existing legal requirements and duties, such as the duty to cooperate, will still apply. These examinations must be concluded with plans adopted by the end of December 26, and these plans will be examined under the current legislation. By November 24, those local authorities with plans more than five years old 
will be considered under the new system with the 30 month timetable applying. There's question marks here as to whether they provide the right incentives to make progress in plan making and we'd be happy to outline them more in detail if you contact us after the webinar. As Andy said earlier on, the consultation on the MPPF changes runs until the 2nd of March. We'll be submitting our own response and we'll publish that in due course. But again, as Andy said, we strongly recommend interested parties take the opportunity to send their own comments. So just to recap then on what we've spoken about today, the consultation sets out short term changes to align with the government objectives with the intention of speeding up plan making. However, the immediate impact seems to have had the opposite effect with a number of local authorities using the state of flux as an opportunity to delay or reassess their strategies. But what's the cost of this? There's serious doubts over the ability to achieve 300,000 homes per annum. And only yesterday, Chris Young suggested that this could halve to about 150,000. We have the politics of Greenbelt and the local character, which are now a hook to reduce numbers, it seems. The removal of the five year housing land supply will also affect the delivery of plans if they're not delivering. There will be increased burdens for sure on local planning authorities to produce design codes. This will have a knock-on effect on LPA resourcing. However, national development management policies and policies on climate change are notable positive steps. So there's more to come with the LERB and the wholesale MPPF changes expected later this year. And watch this space and as Andy said, I'm sure we'll produce further webinars. And that's it for uh, from us. Thank you very much for your time. And we'd like to take the opportunity to answer any questions. I think there's one in the Q&A box. Do you want to pick that up, Andy? Thanks, uh, Rhys. Yeah, and thanks to uh, all of our speakers today. We've taken us quite neatly to just after a uh, quarter to two, which leaves us for 10 or 15 minutes to take questions. Um, I would uh, remind people if they want to ask a question, if you want to type it into the Q&A chat function, we'll be happy to pick those up. Um, I think we've had one question through already, um, which we're happy to, to have a look at. Um, that's from Duncan Murdoch, who's asking, in respect of penalising um, planning delays and the developer accountability topic, I think that Hannah picked up in her slides, does that also apply to local authorities and uh, including county councils? And there's an example there where um, a client with a 350 house site uh, in a plan uh, hasn't brought it forward um, and also a, a county council owned site um, for 320 homes. Uh, does anyone want to pick that one up? Uh, anyone's looking at me here? Well, I mean, I, it raises an interesting question. Um, we understand it to be, John, do you want? Yes, I think we're gonna unmute so so people can pick up as and when uh, in, in the chat. I mean, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start off with my view. I think it applies to applicants. Um, now, it will come down to how it's uh, policed and how it's managed. And uh, presumably if the council is the, the body that's issuing the fines and deciding on unreasonable behavior, then that does raise an interesting question as Duncan's pointed out as to how, whether they would penalize themselves. <laughs> um, but if there's any independent arbitration, which I would argue there should be, then council councils and, and district councils in my view should be as accountable as, as a developer. Uh, I don't think anyone's got any thoughts on that. I mean, I'll, I'll come out from the opposite side um we don't know the backgrounds to the site but or the site i mean ultimately it kind of comes down to as andy said that the onus is likely to be on on the applicants now just reading the question literally as it as it's written i would read those sites as sites where there may not be a, a history yet of unimplemented permissions or bad behavior if you like on the application side but what evidence was there actually to confirm the, the two councils' intentions to deliver those schemes at all during the examination process? And how was that assessed? You know, my guess is that they were winging a prayer deliverable sites, or at best, there was kind of a, 
a, a prospect of a reasonable prospect of developability on them sometime after year six of the plan period. The problem is once you've, you know, if you are going to have bad behavior down the line, you've already failed in your plan because you've hit year six, you've got no land supply test and, and the circumstances that Duncan's outlined are, are obviously ones that haven't supported bringing the sites forward. So, you know, maybe at some point in the future, um, that you're quite right. I think that the 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 the, the penalising measures should impact on um, authorities in those situations. But the the sites should probably have been tested with more rigor before that point. Really. Thanks, John. I think I think with as with a lot of these changes, the devil will be in the detail, and there's not much. Uh, meat on the bones in terms of guidance yet as to how unreasonable behaviour is going to be tested uh, and what constitutes unreasonable uh, behaviour in terms of housing delivery so we will all be looking out for consultation on that and as, as I'm sure clients uh, house builders particularly will be um, to see what sort of things um, it, it covers I mean all I would say is it seems to, to me that this is um, a political response to a problem that doesn't really exist. I mean, the government commissioned the Letwin review, which which concluded, my understanding was it concluded that land banking wasn't really a significant issue in the in the industry. Yet the government still seems very keen to pursue a, a, a sort of approach to to to, to hit um, developers with a stick uh, where houses aren't being delivered for, for whatever reason. So it does seem like a political one. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, the consultation will be there for people to make their comments uh, appropriately on that. Um, there was one question I was just going to put to, to the team, uh, which relates to the urban uplift. And I think probably, John, it might be one for you again, unfortunately. In terms of the urban uplift, John, I mean, the government's talking about massively increasing delivery in the 20 most populous cities of the in the country. And I just think, just wondered on your thoughts of how realistic those numbers are or how achievable those numbers are, sorry, um, in light of what Louise has, has said about local character and uh, the other constraints that come into play. How, how realistic do you think in your experience that the authorities are going to be able to meet those higher numbers? Yeah, um, I'll come back on that. And we've got a few more minutes for questions if anyone else wants to wants to use the chat. Um, uh, I mean, I've got some experience, um, direct experience of of working with or working as part of the, the now adopted London plan um, and the history of its small sites policy. And the um, the background to that is the, G, the GLA pitched that extremely badly regarding the impact on outer London character um, and has notionally left us with a huge unmet need from London, uh, which no one's done anything about in terms of the home county authorities under the, 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 the 2019 onwards NPPF regime or post the adoption of that plan. So what happens post revocation of the duty to cooperate um, and post implementation of the proposed changes well i mean the government's effectively written that scenario into national policy under 11b um you know character varies across every one of those top 20 urban areas um so you'll be open to exactly the same accusation of, of and debate and, and resource implications of design codes um as well as the typical constraints on on sites within a lot of those authorities in terms of viability um but it will also affect, you know, to what ex to to the extent that there's still discussions between neighbouring authorities. You've got plenty of conurbations like um, Luton, Dunstable, Houghton, Regis, where the same character accusation is going to also impact on any on any effort to um, spread need across wider urban areas. We, again, I think that's one of the reasons that the alignment test will fall down. Like some of its intentions might be good in terms of infrastructure delivery, but in terms of actual planning and just grappling with meeting the the numbers that underpin housing need, um, uh, you know, I can only see it being sort of death by a thousand cuts, really, um, to come back to your question, Andy, in terms of whether you you ever get the the delivery that meets the government's aspirations for the urban uplift, i.e. meet it in those centres, brownfield first, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, John. And that's with the, about even considering Greenbelt, um, obviously, which is a huge, a huge uh, constraint as well. Um, do, if anyone does have any questions, please, please, by all means, put them in the chat. Um, we've got another five minutes or so to answer questions if, if anyone wants anything answering or just raising any points for debate. Um, 
I had a, a, a point I was just going to raise, which I noted down during the um, during the presentation, which related to permitted development. I thought it was an interesting point just at the end of your slide, Louise, that where the government are now proposing to introduce design codes as a consideration for prior notification applications. And you mentioned up to an extensions, and I assume it would also apply to things like office to residential conversions. Um, I think it does raise an interesting question about at what point does a prior notification application just become effectively a planning application because you already have to look at flood flood risk constraints, contamination, highways as, as sort of considerations now. And now you've got a design uh, consideration. I don't know, Louise, if you have any thoughts on that as, from a practical side. Um, how far do, do you go with prior notification? Is it going to is it going to lead to people looking more at just doing the application route because it's just as just as onerous? Yes, it may well do, Andy. And I think adding on to that, you've got your ecology implications and considerations as well with a lot of prior approval applications. I think I would say there may be some that are more straightforward because of a design code. They won't um, leave that almost ambigu ambiguity in terms of um, considering whether the design and appearance looks okay. Often local authorities get sort of stuck in the um, consideration of looking at um, how the design of the proposal is, which isn't really a criteria. So it might help sort of um, tighten things up a little bit in terms of the prior approval process to ensure that it is ticking those design code, design guide boxes. However, yeah, I can see you might not be meeting all of the, the requirements or criteria of a design code. Therefore, you're going to have to make the justification and submit through a full planning application with supporting information as to the reasons why and why not um, you're meeting different criteria. I, I think that's right. I think um, and my worry at the moment is that prior notification process, the issues that you have to look at under prior notification are fairly black and white uh, technical issues that you, you either do or you don't meet them the problem with introducing a design code is there's that sort of subjective design um element that you, you know you do it requires a, a subjective judgment about whether you meet a particular design standard sometimes with design we know it's it can be a bit more of a gray area so that does re raise some some slight concerns we have a question from uh ross uh, bloomer who's one of our ex-employees formerly of this parish so thank you ross um have Labour given any commentary on the proposed changes and any alternative approach that they may take? Does anyone want to pick that one up? I think we've got the, the general look around the table is, is not that we're all aware of, but that doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, if it has, it hasn't had much publicity, which Labour would probably uh, wish it to have. Um, John, did you, did you have anything to say on that? Uh, it was at risk of sounding like a politician is it's a dangerous <laughs> answer isn't it i think the only things i've seen from well one thing we haven't touched on um and actually is covered in the consultation report but as you said under there's no idea how it will play out in practice yet there's obviously the question of affordable housing delivery i think the government sees the proposed changes as as at least not lessening the prospects of affordable housing delivery but fundamentally that that will be the outcome on it of lower housing delivery and and you know the, the, the greater extent you rely on the urban uplift you will probably see affordable housing delivery suffer as well so i think um you know you would expect to see the labor party double down on that point and i, I have seen statements that they do prioritize um you know that aspect of the, the housing crisis and housing need the other the other point is probably one around economic development i mean no one knows what will happen into leveling up in inverted commas but productivity in the country again not not blaming anything is not what it was six years ago pre-pandemic and pre-other events you'd like to think that that anyone taking out uh, uh, it's why we touched on paragraph 67 and on on my slide you know the reference to things like economic development is an important reference it, it, it's very weakly referenced in the in the document as as something that actually is housing need i if you don't plan for that you won't support economic development i i can't see labor rowing back from that sort of imperative to support productivity in the economy um so you know would they let things die on the vine like like the references to the arc for example they might not keep it in its current form but they might know that um you know 
in those circumstances. It's what the government, the current government proposed in the prospectus, you know, local housing need is a minimum for those authorities, but there may well be a requirement to specify through national policy and, and bring some more rigor back into the process that 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 ultimately you need to plan at those levels of support economic development, whether they would look to take a geographic focus on that, north, south, levelling up, whatever, whatever. But I think they're the two things that Labour won't get away from, economic development and affordable housing. Mm. Um, and ultimately, it probably means that they need to, to be a bit more aspirational in terms of support and delivery than, than the proposed changes they might inherit, depending on how things play out. Yep, I agree. Um did anybody we'll give, just give people a few more seconds if they want to ask a question we are coming up to two o'clock i think we're just about there now so um if anyone does have a question you've got a few more seconds um otherwise we have just got a very short announcement company-wise that um, reese is going to um to raise before we sign off for today um but thank you for everybody for joining us it's been great to have so many people uh attend it's been a bit of a whistle stop tour i'm afraid but that's always the nature of these things when there's a huge government consultation if you want to have um any more information on any of the changes that we covered today um please do drop us a line and um, when we circulate the slides we will circulate contact details for everybody that's spoken today so you can contact us directly and we'd be more than happy to have a chat um and as, as we've said on more than one occasion today um if you do have any concerns about what's uh proposed then do make a representation to the government consultation and also keep an eye out for the next round of uh, consultation uh, proposals that will be coming out later in the year on a more comprehensive change to the uh, planning system. Um, so on that note, thank you, everybody. I will hand over to uh, Reese just uh, for a final few slides uh, before we sign off. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, so we just wanted to take the opportunity at the end of the webinar, just while we've got a couple of minutes, uh, to remind you of our recent exciting company news. Just before Christmas, you may have heard that uh, DLP Consulting Group acquired Cass Associates, a Liverpool-based multi-disc team, design practice encompassing planning, master planning, landscape architecture, architecture and heritage design. Um, we just thought we'd take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about them. They were formed in 1983 and have won a number of design awards. The CAS planning team, led by Graham Truella, has merged with DLP Planning Limited and will form a new Northwest office operating alongside the other DLP planning offices in London, Bedford and Milton Keynes, Rugby, Nottingham, Sheffield, Leeds and Bristol. Graham will continue to lead the new Northwest office team and uh, we're looking to recruit to that office to strengthen the company's presence in the region. CAS have also undertaken a number of specialist projects in Scotland and that work will continue with a view to expanding the business presence within both Scotland and Wales more generally. And we've got an updated organisation chart there just to show where CAS sit within the group. I won't go into detail, but obviously the slides will be available after the session today. And if we could just go to the final side, please, Andy. The CAS design team will merge with DLP's design team, B1 Architects, and they will practice under the name of CAS. The new design team will operate from offices in London, Liverpool, Leeds and Bedford, and will offer services in architecture, landscape architecture, heritage design, master planning and sustainability. Even Soldo, formerly of B1, and Richard Roberts of CAS will lead the new merged design team with Selma Hooley, overseeing the master planning team within that so that was just a short update you probably heard it before Christmas but we thought it was worth covering it off again today thanks Andy sorry yes uh, thank you very much Reese. that's uh, helpful and thanks again everyone for attending um, and we hope to see you all soon um, once we have some more consultation uh, changes to go through. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.